Good morning Year 4 and welcome to your reading lesson for today. Now I want you to think about the whole chapter that we have read on Monday and Tuesday, the chapter called Abacaxi. Can you answer the following five questions please? So if you pause the video now and have a think about the following questions. Okay, so why did Max run off during the night? Well, we know that he couldn't sleep and he was bored, so he went on a walk, didn't he? And he took the pineapple with him. Now, where did he go? He went outside of the clearing, and what did he find? Well, he found two vultures on the floor and one vulture in the tree. Now, what else was there? That's right, there was an animal what was there, wasn't it? It was a sloth. Now, how did, the fe how did the children feel about what Max had found and what did they do? Who was the main person to look after this sloth? That's right, it was Lila, wasn't it? Now, Lila got the sloth round her arm and was cradling it really, really tightly and making sure that the sloth was okay and that it wasn't frightened. And what did they name the sloth and why? That's right, they named the sloth Abacaxi. Do you remember what the what the word abacaxi meant? Yes, it meant pineapple in Portuguese and Lila named it um, Baca for short, didn't she? So all about this pineapple that they'd found earlier on in the um, in the chapter, in the story, and that is the name of the sloth. Fantastic retrieval year four. Now today we're going to go back to thinking about how to explain and justify inferences, really focusing on using the evidence from the text. And by the end of this session you will be able to read between the lines of, te um, of a text, making conclusions and drawing conclusions about the text's meaning and purpose. You will then be able to draw inferences about the character's feelings and thoughts and you will be able to think about how you could begin to justify these inferences using the evidence from the text. Now I do have some vocabulary words for you today. The first word is crannies. Now you might not have heard of this word before but it is a noun. It is a thing. Now because it has the s on the end that means it's plural so there are multiple crannies. Now it's a two syllable word, cran -ese. and crannies are small narrow spaces. So in the book it's quoted, jungles Fred found were full of corners and crannies. And you can see in this picture here that there are, there is, um, it's bark from the tree. And you can see there's lots of crannies, there's lots of narrow spaces that things can fit inside. And that's exactly how we can use the word, by saying that bugs live in the crannies of the bark. They might live in the small, narrow spaces. So in this jungle, it's full of corners and crannies, lots of really small spaces for things to get inside. And some synonyms for this word are cracks, splits and openings. So there might be some, um, the jungle might be full of corners and cracks, corners and splits, corners and openings. Our second word today is epaulets. So we're thinking of this word epaulets and it's a three syllable word, ep or ets, and it's a noun too, it's a thing. So if you look at this picture, an epaulet is an ornamental shoulder piece on an item of clothing, especially on the coat or jacket of a military uniform. So you can see here that they are here. And in the book it's stated, he looked, Fred thought, like the epaulets on his father's old army uniform. So you can see here that it's worn as a type of uniform, especially if someone is in the military, so the army. And the epaulets are just on the shoulder here. They look like they are made out of metal. They're quite strong and they're quite thick. Um, you can also use this word by saying an army great coat, so an army coat, with fancy epaulets and brass buttons and that's exactly what this picture shows again these epaulets and fancy brass buttons we're going to continue today and start a new chapter called the monkeys and the bees now this is one of our longer chapters it's going to take a few days to finish this chapter as opposed to just two so we're going to start today and read the first few pages so as always read along with your eyes or alternatively you can pause me now and read out loud okay Jungles, Fred found, were full of corners and crannies. They held secrets. But the secrets emerged in the most unexpected ways. They would never, he thought, have found the scrap of paper that changed everything if it hadn't been for the joint efforts of the monkeys and the ants and the bees. 
Max saw them first, later that afternoon. He'd been lying on his back, staring at the sky, while Lila and Con and Fred sat by the fire and tried to make a plan. The problem was, despite being told very firmly to stay put, Max kept trying to explore. And he was a small five-year-old child in a very large jungle. So that's not very safe if he keeps trying to explore. How sure are you that the raft will hold? Lila asked. Fred considered. The raft was wide and strong, and the vines were wrapped so thickly to secure it that the raft was more green than brown, because of the lianas being green. It looked like a rectangle of floating of a rectangle of floating cricket pitch. But he thought the pilot had presumably been just as certain about the plane. So starting to think maybe the raft isn't as secure. If the pilot thought the plane was secure, he was going to drive the plane. It crashed. So that what's not to say that the raft will be a disaster too. Medium sure. He saw Con's face. High medium. And walking would take weeks, he said. We know Manaus is on the Amazon. So if we sail down river, we should reach it. Max approached and sat on Lila's feet, tugging at her sock. Lila! He dug a chunk of snot from his nose and wiped it on the grass. Except, we don't know if Manaus is upriver or downriver from here, said Con. So we have a 50% chance of death. Lila! said Max. Listen to me! But there's a 50% chance of life, said Fred. Con smirked, and he resisted the urge to flick Max's snot at her. Can you hear yourself, she said. Do you know how insane that sounds? Lila! So he really wanted Lila's attention. I wonder what he's going to tell her. Max tugged harder at her sock. Did you see? Did you see? How the monkeys fought the bees? What do you mean? said Lila. Backer had taken up a position draped across one of her shoulders. Back legs hooked under her armpit. He looked, Fred thought, like the epaulets on his father's old army uniform, so those things on the shoulder. The monkeys won, said Max. I followed them. Max, what are you talking about? Lila picked him up and held his face close to hers, blazingly angry. I thought you were in the den. You know you're not allowed to move. I told you. If I can't trust you, I'm going to tie you to me. Max pouted, so he's going a bit like, hmm. I didn't go far. I stayed away because I don't like bees. Maxie, don't lie. There are no bees, said Lila. I've seen every flying thing. Ants and beetles and mosquitoes, but no bees. It was over there, said Max. He pointed to the other side of the clearing, among tall rubber trees. In the high bits. Lila raised her eyebrows over Max's head. Was this a dream, Max, or in real life? Real life, said Max. I don't believe you. Real life! Max looked furious. Think about why he might be furious. Real life! The monkeys washed their hands in the ants, and then they fought the bees. I have no idea what you're trying to describe, said Con, but it sounds terrifying. Max got up, roared and stamped, accidentally stepping on Con's knuckles. Con gave a yell and slapped at his ankles. That hurt, she said. Don't hit him, said Lila. You're not paying attention, any of you, said Max. Listen! Fred looked at Max. The boy's eyes were unhappy and a little wild. We are listening, Max, he said. No, come! Max took hold of Con's hand and pulled her up and towards the trees, his small feet thumping determinedly into the earth. Con looked surprised, but let herself be led, jogging beside him. She didn't comment on the state of Max's hand, which was sticky with unknown substances. Fred and Lila ran after them. There, said Max. There they were. He pointed up at an ant nest. A great bulbous structure built on the tree's trunk, bulging out of it like a pot belly. There were no monkeys in sight. They were here really soon ago, said Max. They'll come back. Skeptically, Fred sat down. Max sat on Lila's legs. Backer clung to Lila's shirt. Sitting still and empty-handed was not, Fred found, an easy thing to do. The thing he was trying so hard not to think about 
His father's face, his mother's voice came crowding in, and darker things, the picture of all four of them, starving, unfound, in the green clearing, cracked towards him. He tried to whistle, but his head swam, and he succeeded only in making a peculiar piping noise. Fred, whispered Lila, you'll scare the monkeys. So he's making this piping noise and Lila is telling him not to make the noise. I wonder why she doesn't want to, um, Fred to make that noise. And then, suddenly, the monkeys came. There were three of them, dark brown and strong-limbed and sweet-faced. Fred watched in awe as they chased one another up and down the trees, chittering. They whirligigged around the trees, flicking their tails. And then the largest of the monkeys, a mother with a baby hanging from her neck, laid her paws on the ant nest. The ants swarmed over the monkey's paws and up her arms until her fur was black with them. Then, fast before the ants could bite, the monkey rubbed her paws together. Hmm, why do you think she's rubbing her paws together? So she's got ants on her paws, why do you think she's paw uh, rubbing her paws together? Hmm, 